Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. And we are back. First things first, Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to 2018. I had a great holiday, but I've definitely been itching to get back to the show. As most of you know, At the end of last year, we held a listener giveaway to celebrate hitting one of our biggest milestones to date, 1 million plays of this podcast. Thanks to everyone who entered. We sent out an email to entrants a few days ago, so please be on the lookout for that. If you haven't heard from us yet, just reach out to us at team at twimlai.com so that we can get you your swag. Next up, the details for our January meetup are set. Next Tuesday, January 16th, We'll be joined by veteran Twimmel guest and Microsoft researcher Timnit Gebru. Timnit joined us just a few weeks ago to discuss her recently released and much acclaimed paper using deep learning and Google Street View to estimate the demographic makeup of neighborhoods across the United States. And I'm excited that she'll be joining us to discuss her paper and the pipeline she used to identify 22 million cars in 50 million Google Street View images. I'm anticipating a very lively discussion segment as well, in which we'll be exploring your AI resolutions and predictions for 2018. For links to the paper, or to register for the meetup, or just to check out previous meetups, visit twimlai.com slash meetup. Finally, a bit about today's show. I'm joined by David Venturelli, Science Operations Manager and Quantum Computing Team Lead for the University's Space Research Association's Institute for Advanced Computer Science at NASA Ames. Devi joined me backstage at the NYU Future Labs AI Summit a while back to give me some insight into a topic that I've been curious about for some time now, quantum computing. We kick off our discussion with a review of the core ideas behind quantum computing, including what it is, how it's applied, and the ways it relates to computing as we know it today. We then discuss the practical state of quantum computers and what their capabilities are, as well as the kinds of things you can do with them. And of course, we explore the intersection between AI and quantum computing, how quantum computing may one day accelerate machine learning, and how interested listeners like you can get started down the quantum computing rabbit hole. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am here at the uh, NYU Skirbel Center backstage just as we're finishing up the NYU Future Labs AI Summit. And I have the pleasure of being seated with David Venturelli, who's the Science Operations Manager for the Research Institute for Advanced Computer Science at NASA Ames. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great to have you on the show, and I am really looking forward to this conversation because you are doing a ton of work in an area that I know very little about but keep hearing a lot about, and that is quantum computing. So before we get into me peppering you with questions, why don't you just tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into quantum compute yourself? Yes. So I'm a, I'm a physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, and I did study quantum mechanics like every physicist does. Back when I was a PhD student in uh, 2008-7, there was hype on in, inside the physics community about quantum computing, but it's nothing but It's nothing like what we have today. What I did, I did study quantum information science, I did study nanotechnology. And of course, I have seen in front of me unfolding uh, the opportunities of actually not only validating the theories on pen and paper, but now experimenting with real world quantum machines. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Quantum Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in 2012 as one of the founding members, NASA, Google, and USRA, University Space Research Association, decided to create this group to investigate the near-term impact of quantum computing for computational problems of national interest. And that was you know, what I've been doing in the last five years. We managed projects in collaboration with government, academia, 
and with, of course, the principal stakeholders, the private sectors as well, to understand really if in the next five to 10 years, there could, there could be an acceleration of computing because of uh, quantum technologies. Great, great. I guess the place to start is on quantum technologies and quantum computing. Like I imagine that it is something that many in the audience have heard of, but don't fully understand, you know, not just what the big ideas are, but what are the the foundational ideas upon which it's built. And I'm hoping maybe you can walk us through some of that. Yes. The idea, the idea comes from the 80s when uh, one of the gods of uh, physics, uh, Richard Feynman, made the observation at a conference, pretty casual observation, that <laughs> if uh, we were able to create a computer which worked with the laws of quantum physics, mm-hmm. then simulating quantum systems would not be very difficult. While today it's very, very difficult to do that. Uh, we need supercomputers and blah, blah, blah. So this observation changed the world because the idea of processing information with the fundamental laws of nature as uh, APIs, as, as elementary building block of the algorithms, really got every physicist excited. Some early discoveries on the fact uh, that the mathematics of quantum mechanics is fundamentally more powerful than the mathematics we employ when we process information in standard digital computers really got everyone excited. Can you give us some examples of that? Yes. So people have discovered in 96 that you can search a database, an unstructured database, where basically all the information is not arranged by any sorting. Normally, to search that such database, you do not have any smart way to do it because you just have to randomly make queries. And if you're unlucky, you will find what you're looking for as the last attempt of your query. And that means that the problem has a linear complexity, meaning that if you have n items, you need n trials to get to the, to the item you want in the worst case scenario. Now, if you had the quantum database and the ability of doing quantum queries and you exploit all these effects of uh, superposition, interference, entanglement, you are able to find the item you want in a square root of the number of items. So this means that instead of, for example, 100 uh, queries, you need only 10. Mm -hmm. And this quadratic speed up is a very interesting phenomenon which shows by itself that quantum computing is more powerful than classical computing because there's no way you can beat this without quantum mechanics. But what people is really after is exponential speed up. So the, the opportunity to devise algorithmical strategies that are able to accelerate exponentially problems. There are some examples in cryptography, in, uh, in uh, chemistry, where we know how to exponentially bypass the bottlenecks of computation so that problems that could be solved today in billions of years, mm-hmm. they would be, would be solved by a quantum computer in seconds. But uh, this is not the case for a, a lot of things that we want to solve. Mm-hmm. And we are investigating, and it's so difficult to investigate these algorithms without having a quantum computer that in some sense, we want to build quantum computers to understand whether it was worth to build them in the first place. So is it fair then to say, uh, what I took away from that is that quantum computers isn't the idea of kind of going piece by piece and replacing the various components on a current system board with, you know, quantum versions. It's not like, you know, shrinking down the the physics is. It is a fundamental new way of thinking about compute that's yeah. built around the, the... It's a new paradigm. It's not incremental improvement. It's really a different fundamental way to process information. Of course, quantum effects are already very well taken care of by the silicon uh, industry in integrated circuitry already mm-hmm. but in, but today they kind of bother you <laughs> you're because you want to shrink things you want to make them more fa- faster now w- what we're talking about is uh, assigning a functional role to the quantum effect and actually assigning logical 
states and variables to quantum states. Mm -hmm. And then very finely, very delicately orchestrate their quantum dynamics so that we do mathematical operations on our logical assignments. Mm -hmm. And this is a new paradigm. It is uh, uh, operating on probability distributions, which uh, are weird because they're not over real numbers. They are over complex numbers. So there are uh, imaginary units involved. And Mm -hmm. it's very interesting mathematically. And uh, funny enough, for for the listener of this show, you don't really need to know physics to become a quantum algorithm person. Okay. It's actually linear algebra. So mm-hmm. as long as you accept why quantum mechanics works, mm-hmm. you can study it in an after... Well, if you have the mathematical background, you can study it fast. And just you don't know why it works. It doesn't matter. But you can start writing algorithms mm-hmm. because it's just, you know, matrix uh, multiplications and, and things, like, things like that. What, what are some of the... You, you kind of rattled off some quantum primitives that, you know, upon which this math and these computers are built. Can you kind of give us a next level of detail into, you know, some of the most important ones? Of course. The main paradigm which is explored today is to use binary variables, so bits, basically, mm-hmm. but uh, generalized in the quantum world. So the idea of using quantum bits or qubits. Mm -hmm. So you do identify a physical system. It could be a superconductor, a circuit, or it could be an atom, it could be an electron, it could be a photon, anything. Anything which is sufficiently small, cold, protected from the external environment, follows the laws of quantum physics. Mm -hmm. Even cats in boxes, apparently. So as long as you are you're able to, to find that, then you... You look at the states of the system and then you identify what is you call zero and what you call one. For example, it could be... Aren't there more states in a quantum system? Yes, but you choose two of them. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, okay. so you say, you say, okay, this electron can have spin up or spin down, for those that know physics. Mm-hmm. Or this photon can have polarization uh, in one way or in another. This uh, superconductor can have uh, a clockwise current or a counterclockwise mm-hmm. current. And then you look at how you can act on the system. Mm -hmm. So similarly as you do in chemistry, if the system is quantum, you you can manipulate their state. Like in chemistry, you can do chemistry reaction. But this time you need to be very controlled. So if it is an atom, you need to shine a laser. If it is a circuit, uh, you need to apply a magnetic field Mm -hmm. and all these kinds of things. And, And when you do that, you know how your state will change. The fun, the fun fact is that uh, it is totally true in quantum mechanics that you can have a state which is not zero, not one, it's kind of a superposition of the two mm-hmm. and is represented by this abstract vector in a complex uh, number subspace where you represent zero and one at the same time. Now, when you look at it, it will be zero or it will be one with some probability. But if you don't look at it, then it's both. And you can operate on it like if it is both until you look at it. Mm-hmm. So the algorithm, the job of the, of the programmer is to figure out a way to operate on this ensemble of qubits in such a way to orchestrate the probability at the end to be the solution of the problem you want to solve. Mm-hmm. But that's a complex job because, you know, if you have uh, n qubits, what you are really describing is a state which has an exponential number of degrees of freedom. Mm. So, and you need to, to basically describe it with uh, two to the power of n complex numbers. And there's no way you can simulate this mm-hmm. in a machine. You need a quantum computer to experiment most of the time. So it sounds like one of the fundamental realities of quantum computing is this chicken and an egg problem. Like how do, how do we get beyond that? Yes, you're, you're totally right. We are getting beyond that. We, we decided, I don't know, the chicken or the egg, what we decided, but we decided that it's <laughs> worth it's worth to, to do it. And we're starting. There are companies, I, IBM, Rigetti, uh, Google, Intel, they're all building chips mm-hmm. and they're making them available to the research community and people are trying to use them mm-hmm. uh, in the short term to learn about quantum mechanics, to validate the theories that on pen and paper have been devised in the last 30 years. So now we are are really using quantum computers as 
tools for improving our knowledge of quantum information processing. Mm. Yeah, so IBM, Intel, some of these companies that you've mentioned have been talking about this for ever, like in a, in kind of research mode. I think the thing that really caught my attention recently was, I think it was their Build conference, one of the Microsoft's recent technical conferences. There was, I think it was a keynote, like their main announcement, Satya Nadella came out and had some researchers and they kind of, you know, brought out this I'm not even sure what it was. It looked like a GPU, to be honest. <laughs> they brought out this board that was their first attempt at a quantum computer or something. You tell me what, yes. what exactly that was and yes. okay. what's its significance. Yeah, no, Microsoft, as well as IBM, as, as you said, like everyone had uh, some quantum computing expertise since mm -hmm. the beginning of time, uh, meaning uh, since, since when the field has a... Uh, as a name, and for good reasons. I mean, good physicists kept an eye on, on the idea since the beginning, and, mm -hmm. and, and these companies hired the very good people. Now, what changed now is that people are confident that we can achieve great results very fast, great results in terms of science, not, not necessarily in applications yet. Because, mm -hmm. uh, And Microsoft, for example, it's interesting because they decided to, they always had a, a very good group on architectures and quantum operative systems and quantum compilation mm -hmm. methods. But now they decided to expand and go experimental as well. Their approach is long term. They want to do a topological quantum computing, which is a complicated mathematical theory which is uh, um, allowing this type of computer to be automatically protected against the noise uh, of the external world so it would be amazing if it ever works however as far as we know nobody has even ever even created a single qubit so everyone is really looking at what they are thinking of doing because even the announcement of a single qubit would be would be interesting. So let me just hit pause on that. So the the qubit is the fundamental yes. unit of this computer. It's yes. it's the bit yes. in contemporary Absolutely. computing. Yes. And we've not produced one yet. No, no, no. In the approach that Microsoft wants, oh. they didn't. Now for ex to give you a sense. So IBM has 16 qubits operational, allowing uh, researchers to use them. Google, and when you say 16 qubits, does that mean... 16 bits. Just 16 yes, bits, not 16, a, an array of 16. No, no, no. Oh, okay. no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you can not even solve a Sudoku with that. It's, uh, it's, it's nothing, okay? Google has nine, uh, okay. but 22 under, under testing, 49 announced... Then uh, Rigetti has about eight. Now, D-Wave has 2,000. You say, oh my God, D-Wave is so far ahead. Uh, who's D-Wave? D-Wave is a Canadian company which okay. kind of schooled the world in the fact that you can try to build a quantum computer. Okay. And they did before everyone. And that's uh, even why my group exists because Google decided to buy one of these machines. Okay. And a then D-Wave machine? At one of the D-Wave machines? Yes. Okay. And uh, to host it at NASA. And okay. that we operated. And is and this uh, analogous to, you know, mainframe computers where it yes, takes an entire it's a room huge, to... it's a huge black box which uh, operates... For 40 bits? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's <laughs> oh, 2,000. 2, 2, 2, but uh, 2,000, there's a catch there. So, first of all, so this is a huge machine. It operates with uh, cryogenics temperature. So, at 13 millikelvin, we're talking about less... Uh, than the temperature of space. It requires a vacuum. It requires yeah. a helium. It's a complex machine. But it implements one strategy of computation, which is quite unknown, meaning that not so, so well studied, which is called quantum annealing, mm -hmm. which does not have all the requirements of the other kind of computation. But at the same time, it's unclear the power of it. So they decided, indeed, to create it to, to experiment. And, and, and NASA and Google and USRA decided to support the project. And then after this, Lockheed Martin bought the machine, Los Alamos bought the machine. So now they're doing quite well. How much does one of these machines cost? The street price is uh, from $10 million to $15 million. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ask know them for is. the latest quote. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's actually I want to advertise in this show everyone can use this machine USRA has a program a collaboration program for which 20% of the machine time 
can be outsourced to any researcher, which wow. is uh, uh, submitting a proposal. It's just a five pages proposal. So the, the website where to find it is www.usra.edu slash quantum and slash RFP, request for proposal. Okay. But So USRA, Quantum D-Wave, if, if you Google it, people mm-hmm. can find. And, and we, and, and we had notes. about 80 people, 80, 80 groups, 80 research groups from all, all kinds of universities around the world, which are running uh, okay. on the machine or they, they propose. Some of them are running, some not yet, but it's a very successful program. Wow, wow. and is all, is all of the research that's happening on this machine about how to build more machines like it or are people doing you know how far are we in in terms of doing things with it can we add one plus one yet with this uh, machine or? yeah no we can we can do more than that but not much more than that <laughs> no you're totally right let's say 90 percent of the really invested research is of fundamental nature We need to improve our understanding, get a different mindset and figuring out how to improve these machines themselves. At the same time, I say that programming these kind of machines, using these kind of machines can often lead to new ideas in classical computing because you need to change the mindset to frame the problem in a different way in order to be attacked by the quantum computers. So uh, very uh, more, there are a lot of anecdotes of uh, you know people coming up with a quantum algorithm that is beating every possible classical algorithm that every classical algorithm that was created before, and then the classical guys came back say, wait a second, <laughs> I can, can improve <laughs> my algorithm, and then they improved the, and they beat the quantum again and so on. Any so, any examples that come to mind? Yeah, yeah, but it's very nerdy example. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a recent uh, re- recent result on uh, QAOA, which is. Um, uh, baptized by us uh, the quantum alternating operator ansatz algorithm okay. which is uh, shown to basically have uh, a particular scaling uh, which seemed to be better to what uh, was before known on a problem which uh, e3 lin it's basically connected to satisfiability but but the point is like a very specific <laughs> problem it seemed that this algorithm was was beating it and then the people and then the, the classical computer scientists came back and, and they improved their own algorithm. Mm-hmm. So th- this is the latest example. In general, I mean, it's it's fun quantum computing because there's so much room for improvement in our understanding that it's really fun. For, is, for instance, chemistry. Mm-hmm. Chemistry is the holy grail of quantum computing because we right. can simulate molecules m- much faster. And and people were, were writing on the back of the envelope calculations uh, seven years ago, six, uh, seven years ago, on how fast a quantum computer would solve, for example, the molecular ground state of interesting uh, molecules, such as ferrodoxin, I remember. Mm-hmm. It's just a fertilizer. I mean, it's interesting. And people were, were trying to calculate it and saying, oh, okay, it would still take some billions of years. Okay? Ah, it's not very interesting because, okay, with a classical computer, it's impossible. It would take trillions of years. Quantum computer would take billions. Okay, it's not <laughs> very, very worth doing it. But then, you know, new postdocs look at the problem and say, no, wait a second, it's not scaling as n to the power of 11. It's scaling as n to the power of 9 because I can do these mathematical tricks. Okay. And then new postdocs and PhD students look at the problem and say, wait a second, why don't I do this transformation before and I represent the problem with Gaussian waves instead, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then they, they put it down to a few years. I say, well, it's still, you know, not very interesting. Mm-hmm. But then in a, in a matter of like, I don't know, a few months, other groups improved, 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 and now we're talking seconds. Wow. So on that particular project, of on years a specific to molecule that people investigated, uh. you know, the initial estimates based on quantum mechanics understanding were so improvable that they brought, they brought down uh, n to the power of 11 to n to the power of 3 and, and make the things uh, much more tractable. And so now what does that, what are the requirements of implementing this algorithm that they've designed in terms of a quantum computer? Does our D-Wave 2000-bit thing get us anywhere near that? Or No, so D-Wave, as I was uh, mentioning before, they can attack only some specific algorithms, uh, combinatorial optimization with a specific method. 
and it, it's unclear what the performance of this machine can be. Mm-hmm. We are investigating them. Early results is that it's comparable with the Intel chips mm-hmm. on these small problems. Now, we would like to investigate them on large problems so that we really could see the difference because now we're still talking about problems you can solve in seconds, so it's not mm-hmm. really clear. The overhead, how much it counts, and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah. But, but this, uh, this is interesting for D-Wave because... Uh, again, every every machine they, they release is a little bit um, more powerful than the previous one, mm-hmm. also on a qualitative level. They give you more knobs, they give you more physical mm-hmm. effects to experiment with. So that's interesting. But to run the algorithms of, for chemistry, for mm-hmm. for uh, database search that I discussed, or cryptography, mm-hmm. you need the computers such as the ones which are created by now by IBM and Google, which uh, right now are at this 9 qubit, 16 qubit uh, stage because they're much more difficult to build, because they okay. give you much more control, and they're called the universal digital quantum computers, as opposed to the D-Wave, which is an analog quantum annealer. So okay. It's a little bit different flavor. So this, so the, if I could paraphrase, the architecture of the, this D-Wave computer is limited in some ways, so that it yes. can only, uh, you can only implement these yes. quantum annealing yes. algorithms, and that yes. a, a, sounds like a smallish subset Yes. Actually, we don't really know exactly. This, we don't know what but types of algorithms will. Yes, they're run easier on this. to build the computers, but much more limited in their algorithmical uh, encoding. Mm-hmm. To, to give you an idea, with two thousand qubits, we can more or less solve problems of that you can classical problems you can encode in fifty bits, roughly. Okay. Okay, it could be 60, sometimes 100. I mean, it depends on the compilation. And is that like, is it's that 2,000 bits or the, the 50 bits? Is this the entire state of the computer? Like inclu- like a traditional computer has, you know, there's state in the CPU, there are registers, there's all of these yeah, things. Yeah, so is yes that and all no. different in yes the quantum no. world? Yes and no. Let's say, no, no, no. Your, your, your question is on point. The end-to-end solvers will be hybrid you know, system which have a classical coprocessor, quantum processor. So after all, you can decompose your problem, pre-process it, divide it in chunks so that the quantum computer just solves the combinatorial aspect of it and the other does something in parallel. So we're way behind in figuring out what's the best way to solve, you know, a a full problem. We are experimenting right now on on very specific special purpose problems. Mm -hmm. And in that case, yes, we can use only this little memory. Okay. And, but it's improving at every at every stage, okay? Mm-hmm. So the next generation machine probably will be much better than the previous one. And how many bits do we need to get to on the universal uh, side to be useful? Yeah, that's a good question. So it depends on the approach. For example, the Microsoft approach it could be... Could be a few hundred for the Microsoft approach, okay. but they don't even have one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, but for the the other approaches, like the ones which are superconducting, we likely need uh, almost a million. Oh wow! Almost. I mean, and we're at nine. Yes, I mean the scalability is there. Right. What is more difficult is the error correction. The error correction, we have very good theories, but we need to get uh, the fidelity of the operations to a certain level of precision. Mm-hmm. But there's no fundamental reason why we shouldn't be able to do that with good engineering. Mm-hmm. You need to understand that the quantum engineer job is a new job. Mm-hmm. I mean, everyone which worked on this is a physicist, and okay. physicists do not know how to, you know, build products. Yeah, okay? yeah. <laughs> so I mean and so now engineers are getting are getting to this okay. game. So I believe that we will have very interesting machines soon. And there's not only the big players, there are startups which come out spun off of universities. Mm-hmm. For example, Ion Q out of Maryland is doing an amazing job with the Ion Trap. Ion Cube? Ion Q. 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 Ion, Ion Q. Q. Okay. They're, they're trapping atoms with lasers and manipulating them. They're very, very, very good at this. There's a University of Bristol group, uh, I mean, in the UK, which has um, some stealth operation on fully photonic computers, so basically wow. a lot of lasers. Okay. So I believe in the... The landscape one year from now will be already different from, significantly from the landscape of today. Wow, wow. And uh, that's fun. So we haven't even gotten to AI yet. Like, what's the intersection between... You're at the Quantum AI Lab. What's the intersection between quantum computing and AI? 
that's a very very good question so our name is might be a little misleading we have a is it quantum slash ai no no no, no. it's a quantum ai <laughs> okay. it's a quantum ai first of all ai is not only machine learning there's a lot of um, methods that are considered AI since even before the hype on machine learning took off. So uh, we do a lot of optimization. It's part of the AI. We do a lot of planning and scheduling, which is uh, one of my personal work where we actually have to take decisions uh, of how robots operate on distant mm-hmm. planets, okay? How to take the robust decisions. Mm-hmm. That's the problem that you, you need to solve by model-based algorithmics. So, so that's, that's why uh, there's an AI in our name, because we do pay particular attention to problems where there's not good solution uh, mm-hmm. yet, and we need expert uh, artificial systems to, mm-hmm. to solve them. But the intersection of quantum computing and AI is uh, interesting, even beyond what we do in the quantum artificial intelligence laboratory. The, the intersection could be on a technical standpoint, on machine learning, there are approaches which are being investigated. This is a very new field, so we're right. talking about uh, only a few years of research, where you can apply some algorithms of quantum computing to gain polynomial speedups on certain aspects, for example, training the neural networks. There are approaches where you can use uh, quantum correlations to implement quantum neural networks. Okay, I mean, this requires a huge number of qubits, of course, but people are, are actually looking at this kind of thing. And, and these quantum neural networks might be very good at uh, uh, learning mm-hmm. quantum problems. Mm-hmm. So again, it's a little bit self-referential, but, right. but that's, that's another approach uh, that is, is being investigated. Mm-hmm. And I must say, there's an intersection on the other point of the arrows. That there's a lot that AI can do for quantum computing. Mm, okay. okay. So the payoff will come afterwards. Quantum computing will pay back in 10 years or something. But for now... Uh, what are some of those ideas, do you think? Even compiling a problem into a quantum computer is a big problem. Mm-hmm. And you need and you need kind of methods, optimization on steroids. Optimization on steroid. Calibrating a quantum computer is also... A pain in, okay? I mean, it's, it's crazy. And again, laboratories are, are, are training neural networks and they are, they are employing heavy heuristics to mm-hmm. be able to, to, to do that. So there is an opportunity on both ends to imagine what quantum computing can do for AI mm-hmm. and how to employ AI to mm-hmm. enable quantum computing. Wow. We're... Getting to the end of our time, but is there a kind of a canonical reference or a place that people can start if they want to learn more about quantum AI or not quantum AI, but quantum computing? Yes, there are a lot of tutorials which have been published over over the years. Not like build your own qubits. No, no, it's not. <laughs> With a 3D it's, printer it's really, maybe? Or? It's really not that inaccessible as it was a few years ago. Okay. So my suggestion is to look for the reviews and the lecture notes of the most prominent uh, professors in okay. the field. Uh, I suggest to look at, the, for example, John Preskill's lecture notes at Caltech. That's a good start. There's uh, another very very skilled evangelizers of quantum computing is Scott Aronson. He mm-hmm. has a fantastic blog, which is very followed, where he discusses a lot of aspects of quantum computing. So mm-hmm. I'm sure that uh, if uh, the listener to this show are motivated, they will find their way. And of course, please feel free to contact me. Uh, my, my, my email is davide, david with an e at the end, mm-hmm. dot venturelli at nasa.gov. Okay, great. Well, David, thank you so much for taking the time out to chat with us. I learned a ton, but there is so much more to learn about this. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. Thanks to you. This podcast finished the year as a top 40 technology podcast on Apple Podcasts. My producer says that one of his goals this year is to crack the top 10. And to do that, we need you to head over to your podcast app, rate the show, hopefully we've earned five stars, 
leave us a glowing review, and share it with your friends, family, coworkers, the barista at Starbucks, your Uber driver, everyone. Every review, rating, and share goes a long way, so thanks so much in advance. As you know, I love to meet Twilma listeners. This week, I'll be at the CES show in Las Vegas, so if you're in the area and would like to meet up, ping me at at Sam Charrington on Twitter. Last, but certainly not least, for more information on David or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 93. Of course, we'd be delighted to hear from you either via a comment on the show notes page or via Twitter at at Twimmel AI. Thanks once again for listening and catch you next time.